archaeology um, is the study of you know material culture so the term hohokam refers to the people places and things that they observed in this area so that term hohokam is an archaeological construct it it's not what the people that lived here called themselves um, it's a descriptive term that is an anglicization of the word huhugam which is an autumn word that we use to describe our ancestors. It describes a state of being. They are no longer living, you know, in this plane of existence. The people that lived here and constructed all of the irrigation systems here called themselves autumn. And we still call ourselves autumn to this day. There are still autumn living nearby. Um, you might know the names differently because we now call ourselves the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, the Gila River Indian Community, the Akchin Indian Community, and the Tonatum Nation. We are the descendants of the, the ancient Sonoran Desert people that lived here in this area. Magayong Culture The Magayong people lived from about 200 AD to 1000 AD in a mountainous region of what is now southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico. Its name comes from the Magayong Mountains of New Mexico that were named in honor of Don Ignacio Flores Mogollon, a Spanish governor of New Spain of what is now known as New Mexico. The people of the Magayong Culture lived in well houses from 200 AD to 1000 AD. Pit houses are structures dug into the ground surface with stake and thatched roofs supported by posts and beams. In the 11th century, the people of the Magallan culture began to live in cliff dwellings, which are room structures built in natural caves. The Magallan used pottery called mimbres. Their pottery was generally black and white with black designs. The pottery was decorated with images of animals, people, shapes, and abstract designs. Holes were found in the pottery bowls, and it is believed that when a Magallan died, a hole was made in the middle of the special pottery, then it was placed on the face of the person who died to allow the spirit to come out. The Magallan people also left amazing images painted or chiseled on the stone surface. These images might have been a way for them to explain their origins of the tribe, why they choose their homes, or show their beliefs. Archaeologists have recorded more than six dozen Magallan rock art sites located in southern New Mexico, western Texas, and northern Chihuahua. And there is many sites in Chihuahua that has never been surveyed. The Magallan people hunted for wild turkeys, muskrats, beavers, black-tailed jackrabbits, and lizards. They also consumed corn, squash, beans, amaranth, pinion, acorns, prickly pear, wild tomatoes, and sunflower seeds. And what happened with the people of the Magallan culture? The native people disappeared 50 years before the Spanish arrived, or disappeared when the Spanish arrived. Some suggest that drought could have been the cause of its disappearance, or as the system fell apart, the Magallan population moved out of the valley and joined other groups and civilizations. So who are their descendants? Many archaeologists believe their descendants are still alive today, and they are the Raramuri, who are located in Chihuahua, Mexico, Hopi Native Americans, Sunni Native Americans, and Acoma Pueblo Native Americans. Mesa Verde was home to the Native Americans from 600 AD to the 1300s. However, after living here for nearly 700 years, they allegedly vanished from the area. All right, folks. 
So here's Soda Canyon. Why they call it Soda Canyon? Well, it's soda wide, <laughs> soda deep. <laughs> During 1240, 1240 is pretty much the end peak population here. Anywhere between three to 8,000 people live in the year 1240 right now, right up here. So as we look across, you can probably hear and see the kids playing in the fields, being chased by turkey. And also, uh, you can probably hear the stone on stone as people repairing and fixing their houses. You could probably smell the smoke of these Pueblos all around us. You could hear the foot drums of Hemingway houses are preparing for an evening ceremony tonight. And all these good things for over 600 years. Over 600 years these people farmed, they lived this land. Population was growing. Beautiful. Folks, things do not last forever. There are a few theories as to what happened to the people living here and why they vanished from the area. One is that they simply used up all of the area's natural resources and moved on. You're going to grab the stuff that belongs to you that you want to make for this long journey. Crawl through that tunnel, the same tunnel that we're going to crawl through here in just a few more minutes, to never, never return again. The 8,000 people that once lived here moved on. And that's when we say, hey, these people disappeared off the face of the earth. Who's gone? No. Go to Akima, Zia, Zuni, Opi, San Juan, San Miguel, San Clara, uh, Jemez. Go to those pueblos in New Mexico, Arizona, and even West Texas. And you will still see construction very similar to what you're looking at here. And you will still see people still using kivas, still to this day, after 800 years. If you go to those pueblos, and you decide to ask them that question, question everybody wants to know. Why did you leave Mesa Verde? Why did you leave Canyon of the Ancients, Hobanwee, Montezuma Castle, uh, Canyon de Che? Why did you leave all these places across the southwest? And I've asked three pueblos this. And I got the same answer three times. It was time to go. That's all they said. It was time to go. Since the glaciers receded, the rich lands of the Mississippi River Valley have always attracted mankind. Here cultures grew and evolved, each borrowing from the previous, eventually culminating in a new civilization archaeologists have named Mississippian. Located at the confluence of three rivers, whose waters provided both food and transportation, Cahokia reached an estimated population of 20,000 people by 1150 A.D., which was larger than London at the time. It was a city complete with suburbs, plazas, and markets. Now keep in mind that there were many permanent Mississippian settlements scattered throughout North America, but this one was by far the largest and most influential. Most of the population lived in small thatched huts arranged in family neighborhoods. Rising over the huts were a number of mounds, some used as platforms for the homes of the elite, a visual reminder of the city's social order. The city included 120 mounds, of which 80 remain today. That was the largest and grandest of them all. It was a city center in more ways than one. There lived the chieftain who was both the ruler and the spiritual leader of the population. It covers more than 14 acres and rises in four terraces to a height of 100 feet, making it the largest prehistoric earthen structure in the Western Hemisphere. Core samples indicate that varying textures of soil were used to assure proper drainage. Just imagine. For hundreds of years, generations carried baskets of dirt from huge borrow pits to make this mound. The work began before the Vikings discovered the New World and was finished just after the Second Crusades. We're at the top of the largest mound from which the chieftain could survey his city. But he was more than a political ruler. He was also recognized as the brother of the sun. 
Archaeologists have determined that a large building once stood here. It was a place where religious rites and administrative duties were thought to have occurred. Nobody's really sure because this was a prehistoric society. What that means is that they had no written language. But the real driving force behind Cahokia's success was not its ruling class, but this. Corn. Somehow the Mississippian culture had developed a knowledge of how to raise this prolific crop in large fields. With the stable food supply, the population grew. Consequently, the city organizations, their beliefs and technology became more complex. In addition, the extra food could be used as trade within the city or with other communities. Another interesting aspect of the city is that it was a planned community. Pathways connected the public areas to neighborhoods. The mounds were built around a central plaza where games were played with much betting. Welcome back to Cahokia, where it's estimated that the height of its population occurred at about 1150 A.D. at 20,000 people. Yet 150 years later, this site lay abandoned. Why is one of the largest mysteries of this city. Without a written language, it's hard to know exactly what happened. But it's thought that a combination of things brought about the demise of Cahokia. For example, the climate was changing. The growing season was becoming shorter. Plus, it was a densely populated area, perhaps as many as 4,000 people per square mile. Imagine all the waste that would have produced. Plus, there might have been competition for available living space. All of these things together could have contributed to the demise of Cahokia. 